Okay, am I clearly audible and can you see my screen? Yes, sir. All right. Okay, so today we are going to discuss a few things. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is around... Uh, like we have understood how the magnetic, sorry, how the gravity anomaly works uh, above a spherical uh, body. Similarly, we are going to look at how it would look like, uh, I mean, how the magnetic anomaly would look like. In this particular case, the most simplest one will be a vertical prism. So let's just first, uh, let me draw this case for you first. And then we will uh, talk about what I'm going to discuss now. So this is my surface. Okay. And as we have done it before also for uh, gravity, let us say there is a uh, body which is kind of hidden beneath in the subsurface okay, which has a surface area of a okay all right now let us say at this point my magnetometer is at this point p my magnetometer is okay and i wish to um, understand the magnetic field due to this magnetic body okay i want to understand the magnetic field let us say the magnetic the vertical component of the magnetic field is bz delta bz okay so why i am writing delta because i want to kind of understand the effect of the magnetic field for only this particular body so it's essentially i have to I have to kind of get rid of the effect of the surrounding, right? So that's why with the similar logic uh, by which we said delta rho, similarly, I'm writing here delta bz, okay? Uh, now, let us say, so this is a vertical prism. So point P will make like a solid angle. All of you understand what solid angle is? The solid angle is nothing but like if you have a cone. Okay. So this is the angle which we call as the solid angle. It's like angle in three dimension. Okay. So this angle, let us say, so this solid angle is, let us say, is capital sigma. Okay. Now, from the middle, from the center of this body, the distance of P is designated with a vector R. And then the angle between R and this delta BZ, let us say that is theta. Okay. Now, <clears throat> You know, we said that the concept of monopole is doesn't really exist in nature, but for our own practical purposes and conveniences, we often use the concept of monopole uh, to make our life easier, right? So let us say that this particular uh, magnetic body, you know, has some accumulation of let us say just for convention, let us say this is uh, magnetic south poles. Okay. And we have designated them as, uh, as with negative sign. Okay. So what do you want to say? You know, this is my north pole and these are my. So now how would you essentially judge how much, how much magnetization this particular body has acquired? <coughs> The other simpler way to look at it is, you know, it's kind of uh, the density of the uh, abundance of the South Pole, okay? So if I have more number of South 
monopoles or more number of monopoles here in this particular area, then I will say it is uh, more strongly magnetized, right? So then what we can, we can say that delta Bz can be, you know, will be directly proportional to sigma. Let us say sigma is actually your monopole density, okay? Monopole density per area, okay? So number of monopoles per area, okay? So uh, sigma multiplied by A, that would give me the, the total number of monopoles present in this, this particular uh, surface, okay? By R square, okay? Into, of course, cos theta, because we are uh, we are not exactly at the at the top, so we are at an angle, so cos theta. So now this a cos theta by r square, a cos theta is nothing but the solid angle. Okay, so this is sigma. And what is then I am left with? I am left with, uh, um, I am left with your uh, small sigma, you know, which is nothing but your, uh, which is nothing but your magnetization, okay? So that is what we can write it, write as, you know, that is, directly proportional to the magnetization contrast, okay? So we can write down, so sigma is not delta m, sigma is directly proportional to delta m, we can write delta m here, where delta m is essential, so sigma is directly proportional to delta m, and delta m is my magnetization contrast, okay? So, now we can see that this Bz, now if I put a magnetometer here, I get a reading of my, um, the vertical component of this magnetic field, okay, which would be a function of the solid angle and will be a function of the contrast in magnetization. So that means, you know, so how do I understand the contrast in magnetization? Suppose if I have something which is paramagnetic, okay, that will have a lower magnetization contrast with the natural normal crust but you know if i have because this the surrounding crust is also uh, pretty much uh, paramagnetic or diamagnetic because it's quartz feldspar mostly continental crust but then suppose if i have a body which is strongly ferromagnetic of course my uh, delta m will be more right that the, the magnetization contrast will be more and the second factor is the solid angle okay so now, if I essentially, with this concept, I'll just keep this equation, sorry. I'll just keep this equation here only and try to see how my magnetic anomaly will look above this body, okay? So the equation that I am left with is delta Bz is directly proportional to the solid angle okay, and delta m, right? Delta m is the magnetization contrast. Now, if I simply draw that, what I will observe, suppose here is my, I'm now drawing in two dimension. Okay, here is my magnetic body. We said this is the south poles, number of south poles, north poles on the other side. Okay. Now you see, immediately above this body, I've not drawn it properly, immediately, what happened? Come on. Sorry. I messed up, 
little bit. So here is my body, and I said these are I have south poles. So immediately I will let me just push this little bit down, okay? Otherwise, my drawing will not be nicer. So immediately above this body, I have, you know, a solid angle. Suppose this is my one. And then here, this is sigma 2. And suppose somewhere in between, this is sigma 3. So you can appreciate that the value of sigma 1 is way more than is more than sigma 3 and way more than sigma 2. So what do I mean by that? That if I am moving away from the body, the solid angle actually decreases, right? On the either side. Okay. And what we are seeing, if my magnetization is con constant, then you know, I can say higher the solid angle, greater the BZ that, that will be detected. So if I now draw BZ here, I will find magnetic anomaly that would look something like, you know, it will never be zero because, you know, it cannot, we have to go and distance of inf infinity, then to attain a BZ, BZ is equals to zero by, you know, uh, if we use, um, uh, Laplace's theorem, you know that that how that is how the all the fields actually work. So it will be zero at a distance infinity uh, at a distance uh, infinity. But then of course it will be very close to zero. But then as we are moving uh, to the closer to the center of the body, okay, of course I will see my magnetic anomaly is increasing, right? Magnetic anomaly is increasing. So this magnetic anomaly has, of course, two components to it. One is, of course, the solid angle. So higher the solid angle, more the magnetic anomaly. And the second one is the magnetization itself. Okay. Now, you know, here also there are two things. I mean, uh, the solid angle will be more if the area is more, if the aerial extent of this body is more. Also, the solid angle will be more if, you know, um, if it is, uh, it is not so much, uh, so much sensitive with respect to the depth, simply because, you know, even if I take it here, the, for if everything remains constant, the solid angle will not change, okay? But, <coughs> sorry, the solid angle will, will definitely change. Yeah, the solid angle will change. So, you know, the, the solid angle is, is a function of the depth, is a function of uh, your aerial extent, okay? And the magnetization itself is, is, is dependent on what type of material it is. So, this delta BZ is, of course, again, it's a non-unique uh, sort of situation. So, you have to, you will need, so, uh, you know, if other factors are, other factors and are constant, then we can actually vary it with one parameter and comment about that parameter. So uh, that is why what I said previously as well, none of these geophysical techniques techniques uh, can give you a unique solution if they're applied alone. So now if you have your gravity and magnetics done together, you know, and you you will have a better, better uh, grip on, on what is going on underneath. Is that clear, guys? Did you understand this part? Can someone confirm, please? Was it clear? <laughs> OK. Now, so like this vertical prism is a very simple body, then what you have to study, although you don't have to remember the derivation, it is enough to remember the uh, 
uh, final expression because you will find questions from the uh, uh, f f uh, in your net or or GSI exam uh, for from the uh, from these shapes. So you must remember about uh, how the magnetic anomaly. What is the final uh, expression for the um, magnetic anomaly for a vertical dike? Vertical dike. It's given in Lowry's book. Uh, then uh, for an inclined body, okay, you don't have to remember the derivations, but it's important to remember the final expression. And of course, you know what does each term of that particular uh, particular expression essentially means, okay? And for a simple geometric body of any random shape. Now, we have already discussed about oceanic magnetic anomalies. How do they look along the mid-oceanic ridges? So I am not getting into it again. But of course, this is another very important topic. So you must read about it. But you, I have already covered that during um, the plate tectonics. Okay? So we know about the magnetic reversals. And we know about how the magnetic strips actually form on the either side of the magnetic uh, on the either side of the mid oceanic ridge, right? You remember that or not? Everyone? Yes, sir. All right, very good. Now, there is another important topic that I want to touch today. And tomorrow onwards, we will start with paleomagnetism, the most important part of, uh, of, of the magnetic uh, chapter. So, but today, we are going to talk about another small topic, but that is very much used in 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 earth sciences this aspect of uh, of magnetism and that is what we call as anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility okay anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility And why we are reading this? Simply because this is very widely applied technique of magnetism in, in earth science. Okay, It's very widely applied and you will find thousands of papers on this particular topic. Okay, And anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility is also um, you know, briefly called as AMS, AMS technique. Okay, Anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility. Now, how we have defined susceptibility? Can someone tell me the expression for susceptibility? K is equals to? How is it? Come on, speak up. What is K? How do we define susceptibility? M by H. Absolutely. So tell me what is M? M is? M is the magnetization. Magnetization, right. And what is H? External field. External magnetic field, right? Yes. So idea is that if I am keeping a particular material or a rock under an external magnetic field, it gets magnetized. How much it will get magnetized depends on susceptibility, right? And susceptibility can be positive. So if the susceptibility in, is positive and high, what type of uh, material is it? If susceptibility is positive and high, Ferromagnetic. Ferromagnetic. If the susceptibility is positive and low, huh? ferromagnetic. 
and if the susceptibility is negative and low divergent so these are the three commonly observed uh, phenomena that we observe in, in nature right so now tell me one thing suppose i have a very regular body okay just for our understanding we are doing this i have a very regular body okay and then i am you know putting it under an external magnetic field h okay. and then this will be magnetized okay now do you think the magnetization will happen in every direction similarly or it will vary or in the other hand let us say will the susceptibility k is an isotropic parameter that means you know the value of k is you know if i plot k around x y z direction okay will the k be isotropic or will the k be an isotropic or it will have different value of k in different directions what is your thinking So, which type of metal it is? Say any rock, you know, which has a very prominent crystal structure. What do you think? How would K be? Will it be iso? I mean, isotropic means the value of K will be exactly the same in the x direction y direction and z direction or any other direction uh, in between okay so that means i can essentially uh, represent k as a spheroid right that means the k will be a uh, k we, we will call k to be isotropic or do you think that k will be essentially can be expressed as a as an as an ellipsoid okay so what does that mean that k has different values along x y and z which one do you think is is the most likely scenario ellipsoid yes that is how exactly it is so and it depends primarily on the crystal structure okay so <laughs> essentially the anisotropy so let me explain this one once more so kz so the first thing you remember that, you know, the, uh, sorry, actually what the way I will write this one down as, so the major susceptibility axis is called Kx, okay. This is Ky and Kz. Now, what is generally observed, the, although it is not very, what should I say, intuitive, that generally this uh, susceptibility is actually anisotropic okay now the degree of anisotropy might vary in some cases the ellipsoid must be very constricted in some cases the ellipsoid must be could be very close to a sphere i mean kx ky and kz are very close values to each other so that is what we call as low degree of anisotropy but then that the degree of anisotropy can be very high as well okay so what it means that the magnetization happens differently in different directions that's all okay now in which direction this uh, kx will be maximum in which direction ky will be maximum and in which direction kz will be maximum depends on the shape and isotropy of a mineral grain this is also very in interesting shape and isotropy of a mineral grain okay and it does not necessarily depend on crystallographic anisotropy does not depend on crystallographic anisotropy now what do i mean by crystallographic anisotropy you know that any crystal 
I can have three axes, right? You have studied crystallography already or not? Huh? Um, sir, we have studied a little in the first year. A right? little bit, right? So you yeah. at least know that there are, you know, A, B, C, three axes with which I we actually uh, try to express the uh, isotropic or anisotropic nature. We, de we define crystals into different classes, hexagonal, triclinic, monoclinic. Remember that, right? Yes, yes. And then we, we generally say there are axes like A, A, B, and C axis. Okay. So, you know, the so these the difference in the values of these A, B, C crystallographic axis is generally expressed as uh, crystallographic anisotropy. That means the crystal itself has uh, is not uniform. Okay, except the cubic system, it's not a it's not a uh, isotropic crystal. So there is crystallographic anisotropy. Okay. Now there is something called shape anisotropy. Now suppose I have broken this crystal. Okay. And broken this crystal and the crystal looks now like this. You know. So as if I have I have broken it from here. Okay? I have broken it from here. So now I can see my longer direction is along. No more along B. It is, it is along A. Do you understand my point? So it's this shape anisotropy. So what is generally observed that shape anisotropy actually dominates over crystallographic anisotropy. So now if I wish to magnetize this particular grain, generally we observe that, you know, along the longer direction of the shape, Kx actually present. So what does that mean? That I have I have broken a grain and then I am I have <clears throat> this peculiar peculiar shape of a particular crystal grain is there. Okay. Now what I am observing that my magnetic susceptibility axis, the maximum max magnetic susceptibility axis is kind of coinciding with the longer direction of the of the mineral grain. Similarly, the shorter direction uh, matches with Kz. And the intermediate direction matches with ky okay so what do i mean by that if i if i study the crystallographic sorry if i study the magnetic susceptibility the anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility i will have a fair bit of idea about how the grain looks like you know in which direction my uh, maximum maximum uh, the longer axis of the grain is present, in which direction my shorter axis of the grain is present. Is that clear? Now, in some cases, the shape and isotropy might coincide with crystallographic and isotropy. In that, those cases, it is fairly straightforward. But if my crystallographic and isotropy and the shape and isotropy are different, then the shape and isotropy is actually mimicked by the uh, <clears throat> anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility is this point clear guys can you can you can you confirm yes sir okay so suppose now this is a broken grain okay this is a broken grain okay of any shape now wh which is the longest direction of this grain if i want to this is the longest direction of this grain okay now this is the intermediate direction of this grain and this is the shorter direction of this grain okay so let us say this is x this is y and this is z okay for this grain after breaking up now you know it might so happen that this is the c axis of the crystal okay this is what i want to say that the crystallographic anisotropy is not the same as the shape and isotropy okay now if i essentially magnetize this what i will observe that my anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility ellipsoid will kind of coincide with the shape and isotropy so here will be my kx here will be my this is how the ky will look like and this is kz okay. so maximum susceptibility will be along the longer direction of the of the grain now suppose 
I am looking at a river. Okay. Or say for example, anything. For example, magma is flowing from this direction to this direction. Okay. This is current situation. Suppose here is a volcano from which magma has come out and magma is flowing. Okay. From, you know, northwest to southeast. And while the magma is flowing at the at the top, you know, because of the temperature, because of the cooling effect, the magnetic minerals are now being precipitated or are being formed from this cooling magma. Okay. Now let us say I am observing some magnetic minerals. Okay. Suppose those magnetic minerals. So in general, what do we observe? That we observe that the Magnetite, in which system magnetite forms, do you know? Do you know which system magnetite forms? Which crystal system? Magnetite forms in cubic system. Okay. So cubic system means it doesn't have any crystallographic anisotropy. Right? Magnetite forms in cubic system. It doesn't have any crystallographic anisotropy. But, you know, due to incomplete formation of the grain, or breaking of the grain, I am observing a needle-shaped magnetite. Okay, suppose this, this particular flow has a lot of needle-shaped magnetite. Let us just put that a different color. Yeah, so I have a lot of needle-shaped magnetite in this flow. Now, if I actually, you know, you can do this experiment by, by yourself. You know, what I will observe that these needle-shaped magnetites which will kind of get themselves aligned. The longer direction will be kind of along the direction of flow. Do you agree with me or not? More or less. If I do a statistics, I will observe that my longer direction, because of the mechanical force itself, these, these magnetites will be along the direction of the flow. Do you agree with me or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right? Just due to mechanical force. You know, something which is which is elongated, that gets aligned along the direction of the flow. Okay? So now, suppose I want... Now, this, this has happened, and now, you know, I, I just have a rock which is present with me. You know, I have taken a sample from this. I don't exactly know. I just have a basalt with me. I don't know. I, I just want to find out the direction of flow. So one thing I can do, I can take a thin section. Okay. And study the study how the magnetite essentially is oriented. That I can do, right? So I have to take a very oriented sample and then I can study under microscope in which direction my magnetites are actually or any, for that matter, any other elongated min min mineral in which direction they are actually uh, oriented. And I can say that this is the direction in which the magma actually had flown. Can I say that or not? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Now, say for example, I have an area of say 20 square kilometer. Okay. And in every... You know, maybe at every one kilometer or one square kilometer or two square kilometer, the flow direction actually changed. Okay, so I have a situation now as a real geologist or geophysicist, you are in the field, okay, and you want to understand how the magma flew. You know, in an area which is like. No, 100 square kilometer area. Okay. Now, suppose the magma, you know, I don't know simply how the magma flew. So, you know, I have this huge basaltic cover which looks of any shape. Now, you know, I have taken samples here, here, here. Maybe I have taken like, you know, 
500 samples to understand the flow behavior everywhere. Now, can you imagine if from all 500 samples, I wish to make thin sections and study them under microscope, you can appreciate, I don't know how many of you are exposed with the process of making thin section. You know, it can be a very tedious job. Yeah, and it is almost, it's very difficult. Maybe it will take five years to actually know or understand how it is. So instead of, you know, preparing thin section from each one of them, what you can do, you can actually calculate magnetic susceptibility, which is rather easy. You know, you take a sample, you push it inside a machine, and in, in a minute, you will calculate how the magnetic susceptibility ellipsoid looks like for each sample. Okay. So suppose I have a susceptibility ellipsoid. Say we are just drawing right now K1. I am seeing my K1 is oriented like this here. And I have found out, you know, such a such a pattern of K1 distribution from all the samples. Okay. Now, can I comment on the flow of the mag magma from the distribution of K1, which is the maximum susceptibility ellipsoid, which is the uh, major axis of the susceptibility ellipsoid, K1? Can I comment? that which direction my uh, flow happened? Yes or no? Rather than making thin sections? Yes or no? Yeah? Come on. Yes, yes. yes. So we can, right? So what we are trying to, trying to convince, what I'm trying to convince to you is that so I can use the susceptibility ellipsoid. So I can use susceptibility ellipsoid as a proxy for grain anisotropy or shape anisotropy. Now this, this, if this shape anisotropy, if, now if shape anisotropy has some relation with magma flow or river flow or deformation even okay how deformation and and shape anisotropy is related you will study them during uh, some of the papers that we will do as assignments later on and also you will study them in in uh, in detail in, in in the next semester for structural geology so shape anisotropy actually responds to such phenomena. And then if I can understand this, the gross or statistical shape anisotropy of the mineral fabric and how they are aligned from the susceptibility ellipsoid, I can comment on magma flow. I can comment on how the river flown, or I can also comment on the deformation, how the deformation took place. Okay. So this is how anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility is generally used. This will be further clearer when you do the assignment that I'm going to uh, offer to you uh, later on uh, during the course after this uh, chapter is done. <clears throat> okay. Any question? Uh, sir, I had a question. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. So about the magnetite, uh, mm -hmm. you said that it usually crystallizes into a cubic system, right? Mm -hmm. And since it is cooling in a flowing lava, it gets broken into needle shapes and gets it's not always because bro 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 broken i mean sometimes the crystal cannot form perfectly you know suppose i have a plagioclase grain okay two plagioclase grains okay and in between in this interstitial space my magnetite is growing okay 
so the magnetite cannot express to become a cubic i mean the crystallography will still be cubic but the shape will be like a needle shaped uh, then so, you right. can get crystallization as well. so uh, sir, if if the rock is cool, cooling plutonically, like under the surface, mm -hmm. then the magnetite crystals will be formed properly, right? So Absolutely. they will not achieve magnetization. Yes. So if if my magnetite actually forms in a very beautiful cubic system, I cannot apply magnetic susceptibility technique on it. Right. That is absolutely true. Yeah. So then, does that rock? Uh, so then, to achieve magnetization, the rock will have to go through like breakage or erosion, right? No, no, no. Magnetization will be acquired. Don't, no, no. Don't get me wrong. The magnetization will be acquired, and the magnetization. If so, 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 if I have a cubic shaped crystal, you know, if I have a cubic shaped crystal, what does that mean? My K1, K2, K3 will be equal in every direction. So magnetization will be acquired right. by the rock. So it will be uniform in all directions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The okay. susceptibility ellipse susceptibility will not be an isotropic. Okay. Get my point. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's, that's exactly it is. The rock will be magnetized. This ferromagnetic mineral, and you have a strong magnetic field. What would happen to the uh, magnetic moments? They will align. But the susceptibility will not be anisotropic. If if it if it allows in a, in a plutonic condition, if you if you allow them to cool with a sufficient, uh, so that is what also happens. So you know about dikes, right? Yeah. So what happens, for example, if I have a dike? Generally, the so these are the margins of these dikes, huh? This is, these are the two margins of the dike. So the margins get very cooled and chilled very quickly, okay? And you, you form magnetites. The, the magnetites that are formed in, at, the, at the margin are generally not euhedral. They, are, they have a kind of a shape and isotropy. But the ones which form in the middle, okay, you don't have to even go into a plutonic rock, you know, in a heap abyssal rock itself, the, the magnetite which forms in the middle they are euhedral almost. So you cannot apply AMS here in most of the cases if the dike has considerable thickness. So you have to take samples from here because that is where susceptibility will be an isotropic. You understand my point? Uh, yes, sir. With the same logic, the plutonic rock actually forms euhedral. Uh, cubic shaped uh, magnetite. Similarly, the magnetites that will form in the middle of a dike, okay, they will be also euhedral and cubic shaped. So the anisotropy will not be there. Right. So here we use anisotropy to mainly determine the shape or the orientation of a of particular. A grain. Huh. Grain. Yeah. yeah. That is exactly. But then this shape and this orientation is is actually very much uh, that responds very well to this physical phenomena like magma flow like deformation like river flow okay and hence we we can use them as proxy for such uh, physical phenomena as well okay right but sir isn't it also like observable like for example no, the magnetic no, no, no. You needles will be, you will be surprised it's okay. not it's it's, uh, it's it's not always observable and especially when you have a lot of data to work with okay so uh, i mean you can observe them under microscope yeah that is that is that is quite true then you know so if you want to ro see a rock under microscope you have to prepare a thin section and if the people preparation of a thin section, you know, it takes at least a week or so to prepare one thick, thin section. And you want to have a statistical average. So, you know, you want to have a lot of thin sections for such study. Okay. So, so to reduce that effort, you use an isotropy of magnetic susceptibility as a as a proxy. Right. So, so do we measure it in a large scale? Like if we take a big rock, then we can just measure yeah. so it. So you have to break a break. A, you have to break. Uh, you have a rock which is oriented. You take a sample. 
and then you drill out small cores okay like uh, because because of the sam because of the sample holder present in an instrument which we call as kappa bridge okay kappa bridge so it has like 22 millimeter uh, radius and 25 millimeter height sample holder which is of a cylindrical shape okay so so you have to take out samples by drilling that sample of course right small cores yeah. of that size and then you put it inside the uh, inside the copper bridge and what happens nowadays it's completely uh, automatic this actually moves in all 64 directions yeah, or 128 directions and measures susceptibility in each direction and then in plots very quickly within a minute it plots this, this whole susceptibility like so oh. okay thank you sir yeah anything else <clears throat> Uh, so, sir, so it's like if we have any uh, particular rock piece that, and we don't know what it is composed of, so mm. we just take a sample of it and make thin sections out of it, and uh, do this susceptibility measurement on it, and yeah, or, we can or, tell or, by no, the shape no, of no, the. Uh, yeah. So, no. You what do you want to understand? You want to understand the magnetic mineralogy, is that right? Yes, sir. We want to identify what type of what rock type it of is. magnetic? No, no. What type of rock it is? That you so can if identify. we already know the if we already know what the <laughs> ellipsoid of different types of uh, minerals looks like, then no, to identify minerals you don't have to do this particular process. I mean, you have easier processes to do. Like for example, whether it is magnetite or hematite, you can calculate its Curie temperature. So you can do something called temperature dependent susceptibility. Okay. So you heat up a sample and measure susceptibility. And then, then you see like my susceptibility drops at a uh, particular temperature. Say if it is around 578 degrees centigrade, I know it is magnetite. Okay, if, if this breaks at 675 degrees centigrade, I know it contains hematite. Okay, also you take your sample and look through scanning electron microscope in EDS. You know, and you, you actually scattered a beam through it and you can directly get the composition. Okay. And the composition can be plotted, plotted in this TIO2 FEO, FE2O3 diagram. Okay. And then you, you know what exactly the composition of these magnetic minerals are. So to understand the composition of the magnetic mineral, you don't have to do magnetic susceptibility study. So magnetic susceptibility study or an isotropy of magnetic susceptibility study is done to understand the shape of these, uh, the statistical average of the orientation of the grains. Okay. Is that clear? Uh, yes, sir. But if we're uh, cutting the grains into thin pieces when we're studying them, then how would we know the exact shape of the grain itself that the piece came from? <laughs> you have not seen a thin section, have you? Okay, so you cut the whole, uh, cut whole, the whole grain rock. into one. No, no, you okay. cut the whole rock. You can't cut the grain. You can pick up the grain sometimes with very sophisticated techniques, but that is not something which is always done. Okay. So you pick, you just cut a sample and look through microscope make a very thin section of the of the rock so it will contain uh, slices of many grains and exactly, exactly. okay okay thank you sir have you not seen a thin section as yet sir we've never been to the lab no 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 but in your some of the lectures or anywhere never seen a thin section that a picture of a thin section how the rock looks under microscope you have not seen i think, I think they showed it once in first year ah. but, uh, i don't think we i mean i at least i don't remember it very well okay just give me one moment then let me just show it to you okay let me just show it to you uh, because that's i understand now 
where is your confusion? Uh, So these are the pictures of all rock thin sections okay so you can see here so this is how the rock will look like under the microscope okay so you can see you can see these are different mineral grains okay? from the look of it this looks like a clinopyroxene okay because i can see this beautiful cleavages okay? which is at an angle okay and perhaps these are these uh, these are my plagioclase feldspar, this white stuff. And this uh, blue stuff is the cement. And do you see these black grains here? Do you see these yes. black grains which appear opaque under transmitted light microscope? These are perhaps your, um, these uh, oxide grains, you know. So these oxide grains like magnetite, like hematite, they appear black under reflected light microscope, sorry, under transmitted light microscope. So what is transmitted light microscope? You know, you, uh, so there are two ways of looking through a thin section through, it's like a slide, you know, so you make the rock so thin by polishing it that it almost looks, the, the light can pass through it, okay? In general, you cannot pass light through, uh, light through a rock, right? Unless it is like quartz or so, if it is transparent or translucent. Otherwise, you know, it's mostly uh, fairly dark or opaque, so you cannot pass light through it. So what do you do? You break that rock and you like make a chip of that rock and uh, put it on the top of a slide. And then you, uh, you know, grind that rock for several days. And finally, what do you do? You actually observe them under microscope. So the, now the section is so thin that light can pass through it. Now, what happens for these uh, these magnetic minerals, which are like magnetite, hematite, uh, the oxides, they appear as opaque under microscope, under transmitted light microscope. Now, if you look through that same uh, rock under, uh, you know, reflected light microscope, then you will be able to, uh, you know, see some features in them. They will appear brown. So when are you guys back in the uh, in the in the campus? Sir, as of now, they are saying that they will uh, call us by end of September. Okay. But so that's once, very once you, are here, once you are here, please come and contact me. I will be glad to show you how the thin section looks like, how the process actually works. Okay, you will eventually learn them, but as you were, I mean. Uh, you know, this is one of the fundamental things. It's no harm of seeing them in, in real. So we will go to the lab and show you how it works and uh, and demonstrate how. Yeah, I'll not ask questions in the exam for them, but, you know, of course, uh, I'll be more than happy to show it to you. Okay? Definitely, sir. Thank yes. you so much. Yeah, sure. So what my, my point is, you know, now now you can see what I can do, I can measure the orientation of these magnetite grains here. Okay. You can see they are also fairly euhedral. So they are not magnetite needles, but these are magnetites, you know, or uh, something oxides. So they, this is how they look like. You, so just type thin section and in Google. Yeah, this is, this is you see, this is, uh, beef, so the, I have taken a piece of rock, okay? And then I have made them so thin under these slides, on these slides and attach them on the slide that I can look, look them through under microscope. You understand? This is what we call a thin section. Yes, yeah? sir. Uh, sir, so by this also, yeah. we'll only know the susceptibility in two directions, right? So what about the Exactly, exactly. So that is, an, that is another problem. So we will not be able to uh, understand the third dimension of the of the of the mineral grain. So what you can do to understand the third dimension, you have to cut different sections. Okay. Perpendicular sections. Perpendicular sections. Them. Now you don't measure susceptibility on them. This is where you just look at the mineral grains and you can actually measure the orientation of the mineral grains physically. Okay, under microscope. But for susceptibility, what you make is like cubes, 
score score for yes, let's see if i see some pictures of core okay you see here a magnetic a, a core is being drilled okay this is a this is a rock i hope something works out You see, this is a drilling machine. So this drilling machine is also here with us in uh, in my lab. So you can actually drill out a core. So you know, this is like a drilling machine, and here is and beneath you have this rock from where you cut the core, from where you you kind of take out this cylindrical core. So you don't need to make a thin section. You can pu put this particular core. Let's see if I have more pictures. Okay, so a core should look something like yeah, like this, you know, of smaller size, of course. Okay, these are drill cores from from underground wells, but of smaller size, of centimeter, uh, millimeter scale. Okay, yeah, well, maybe this one. This is a good one. This is this is like core. Okay, and then you put that core. You don't have to make a thin section. You put that core in a copper bridge, and in that copper bridge, you measure this susceptibility. Uh, directions okay and which will be <clears throat> a proxy to the actual sh shape of the minerals okay is that okay, clear sir. now yes sir thank you okay very good anything else Okay, all right then. So I will uh, stop it here uh, and uh, yeah, we will continue tomorrow. Thank you.